Hey guys, John DeLaHaye here for Practical Machinist, and we're back with the third installment of the CAM files. I don't know if you saw my first episode, but in that one, we machined an aluminum prototype of a custom motorcycle part for my customer. We sent the part out for test fitting to California, and he recently got back to me and told me that it fits perfect, so we're safe to proceed to make five of them out of magnesium. On this episode of the CAM files, I'll be going more in depth of the tool paths that I'll be programming so I can show you my techniques to achieve different radii and other features that I'll be machining. Now, with a material change from aluminum to magnesium, I'll also need to make changes in my feeds and speeds and radial engagement. Once the parts are successfully machined, I can send them out to the customer and we'll be good to go. When I reached out online for information regarding the machining of magnesium, it seemed there was a tremendous amount of varying opinions and superstition regarding the matter. I quickly noticed that the prevailing absolute fact of the matter was that magnesium is a flammable material and caution needs to be exercised when machining it. Many people online said that if a magnesium fire was to occur inside of the machine with regular coolant, the water in the machine coolant would only stoke the fire and create a very dangerous hydrogen gas. It was also then that I learned the thinner the chip and the finer the chips, the more flammable they are especially when resting in big piles inside of the machine. To negate these problems, I decided to run without coolant, which also helped for filming purposes. To increase my chip size, I also increased my radial engagement on my milling passes to improve the chip load. Bigger chips would decrease the chances of a fire hazard. All right, we got our op one set up here. I'm gonna go to edit. I always set my stock tab on fixed size box. It's at the top of the drop down list. Um, now that this was customer supplied material, a different size from the last time we made the prototype, I measured the new pieces of material provided by the customer and I input them in the width, depth, and height fields. Um, I always set my model position for Z offset from top at the top of this drop down list right here. Uh, that increases the amount of material I'm holding onto for rigidity purposes, and it also minimizes the amount of material that I would have to remove off the top, saving cycle time. And as for the work coordinate system, I always set my origin as a, the center of the stock, under stock box point, right here. Go to box point, find the dot in the center, it's the center of the stock. I decided to drill the mounting holes first, all the way through the stock, so I could indicate for OP2 at a very precise location on the part. When drilling through the stock, I opted for a 20 thousandths peck, so I could safely drill through the part without picking up too much heat in the drill without using coolant. This is the type of cycle called a G81. This works good with the full retract, and I like the result. The drill peck drilled all the way through the stock without any problems. For the roughing operation, I came up with a strategy for milling dry magnesium by increasing my optimal load setting from 50 thousandths to 70 thousandths to enlarge the chips. I also decreased the feed rate of the half inch roughing end mill from 205 inches per minute to 75 inches per minute to reduce heat buildup and to prevent sparks or fires. Finally, one of the biggest changes I made in my 3D adaptive roughing strategy was increasing radial and axial stock to leave for future finishing operations. I changed both from 5 thousandths to 10 thousandths to increase tool engagement and avoid creating flammable magnesium dust-like chips and particles during the finish passes. I'm going to be honest here and level with you guys and admit the first time I roughed one of these out, I was pretty nervous. Uh, the ZK-60A magnesium alloy, uh, the T5, was kind of spooking me. I, I did my research. I learned that it had a zirconium and zinc content. I really didn't know how that was going to cut in the machine. 
So I was pretty nervous the first time I ran it. But as you can see here by the footage, it was just shooting huge rooster tails, cutting beautifully. And just sliced through it like butter. I had no issues, no galling up of my end mill, no nothing. It just cut really nicely, better than 6061 even, I think. After the roughing passes on Op 1, it was time for the finishing passes. I decided that this was a good opportunity to share how I program a corner radius on a part. First, I use Fusion's measure feature to inspect the size of the corner radius by clicking on the line geometry. Once the corner radius size is known, I then select the appropriate tool from my tool library. After inspecting the feature, we now know that the corner radius is 60 thousandths. So naturally, I'm going to choose a 3 8 end mill with the 60 thousandths corner radius. I do this by selecting the path's line geometry in chain mode. To select the exact geometry lines I want the tool to follow, I hold down the Alt key while I select each line segment as an open chain. Once my chain lines are selected and going in the correct direction, I then go to my path's heights tab. For my bottom height, I choose from selection and then click on the line segment right at the bottom of the corner radius feature. Now that my path and bottom height are set, it's now time to go over to the Passes tab and select Roughing Passes. For how far my end mill is sticking out due to clearance issues, I opted for two extra passes with a step over of 25 thousandths for a nice finish. Now I can simulate the tool path and make sure that the tool is making it into the corner radius and doing exactly what I want. Everything checks out good. It's time to let her rip in the machine. Now that the part is roughed out and the radius features around the perimeter are milled, it's time to proceed with the usual finish passes that I described in my first video. The only difference now being that we are taking off twice the amount of material to create bigger chips. This was done by doubling our stock to leave on the first roughing passes. After the 3D contour surface finishing passes with a quarter inch ball nose end mill, it was time to finish the outer walls and clean up the bolt head faces with the half inch end mill. Once the facing step overs on the top had finished, it was time to move on to the finishing chamfers. In my original episode of programming this part in aluminum, I opted for a skinny 1 8 diameter 45 degree chamfer. This was for the purpose of having the tool clear the sides of the protruding feature I like to call the steeple. Looking back, sticking a 1 8 diameter chamfer out that far was a terrible idea. 
It caused a lot of tool run out and deflected like crazy when cutting, causing some serious chatter. This time around, with hindsight being 2020, I opted to chamfer all of the edges with a quarter inch diameter 45 degree chamfer instead. The way I was able to mitigate the issues of tight, close spaces to the walls of the part was by adjusting the chamfer tip offset and chamfer clearance values inside of the passes tab. The chamfer tip offset value adjusts just how far the tip of the chamfer will be below the selected edge. Since the angle of the chamfer is 45 degrees, the further down the tip travels at an angle, the further the shank of the tool travels away from any surrounding features or obstacles. The chamfer clearance value can also adjust how close the cam system will let your tool get to any of said walls or obstacles. Once I finished my new chamfering passes, I was super happy with the results. I couldn't have asked for a better Magnesium Op 1 for my first article. Now, moving on to Op 2, I used my little alignment trick for reusing the same Op 2 soft jaws that I machined for the original prototype. I align my soft jaw by tightening the bolts for the moving jaw once it's flat and leaving the fixed jaw bolts just slightly loose. I then gently align the part into the jaws and tighten and loosen the vice jaw carefully back and forth until the fixed jaw self aligns itself with the part. I make sure the jaw is sitting flat and then I tighten the fixed jaw in place. I know this isn't a cam tip but it's an old trick I learned while working at a job shop years ago and I hope it can help somebody else out there. Now that the part is clamped in the jaws, it's time to go over the work coordinate system's datum location. Obviously, I drilled my mounting holes through the stock for this reason so that I could locate off of it for OP2. After indicating the top left hole that I chose, I then set my tool plane on top of the remaining stock and then subtracted its thickness from my G54Z0. Since I don't have a wireless probing system in my machine, I go about it the old school way with the dial indicator, which is what I like. I'm used to it. Someday I'll get a probing system, but for now, I'm cool with it. So for OP2, I left all of the tool paths basically the same, except for the initial decking off of the remaining stock. With my half inch roughing end mill, I chose to reduce my feed rate and decrease my step over distance at the same time. I did this to lower the tool pressure to keep the part from moving or shifting inside the jaws and to reduce the heat of the end mill running dry. Initially on the prototype, I had the end mill roughing in both directions, climb and conventional. But when it came time for the magnesium remaining stock to shave itself off the part, the last pass would come in conventional and would cause the remnants to sling and fly into my machine side window at Mach 3. I changed all of the facing passes to climb and everything went fine from there on out. Here you can see the climb milling stock removal in action, gently removing that excess stock so that my parts don't shift in the vise. So seeing that slug of remaining stock shoot off like a rocket made me realize that I should have programmed my 2D outline contouring step downs prior to my rough decking step overs. This is how I normally program all of my OP2 roughing operations, but this time I failed to and I think it's probably because of some sleep deprivation and also I was dissuaded by the immense thickness of the remaining stock caused by the customer supplied material for OP2. Then came the face milling with my 4 inch face mill. This magnesium looks like a mirror. I always finish face my covers mating surfaces before milling out the inside main pockets. I do this because once the inside is milled out, the missing material will cause the vice jaws pressure to move inward, slightly warping the part. Facing after this pocket material is removed would cause the mating surface of the cover to no longer be flat. Next came the 3D pocket finishing with a quarter inch ball end mill. Looking back, I should have relieved the end mill shank by grinding it down. You can see why on that back left corner where the shank rubbed a bit.
After that was facing the main pocket floor with a quarter inch flat end mill. Lastly, for OP2 was the chamfering operation. The outside chamfers lined up perfectly due to how I set my work coordinate system location off of the center of one of the mounting holes. I must say that I'm extremely satisfied with how that OP2 came out with a material that I've never machined before. It's time to set up OP3. I've installed my already machined OP3 jaws into the vise and then indicated my special machine jaw feature that I designed in CAD and incorporated into my part program. With my work offset now set, I set my tool plane on top of the jaw and will machine OP3 the same way as I did with the aluminum prototype in my first episode. First, the mounting bolt head face is cleaned up and machined flat to prepare it for the quarter inch 90 degree spot drill. Next, the spot drill will dive down deep enough for the hole to have its own chamfer at the top. Finally, the appropriate size jobber drill pecks away down into the magnesium until it leaves a perfect hole in the part and it is now finished. If you have any questions regarding more of the programming and setup details for these parts, make sure to go look at part one. It's the second episode of the CAM files on the Practical Machinist YouTube channel. Man, these magnesium CR125 power valve covers came out really awesome. I'm going to ship them out tomorrow. I don't think the customer could be any happier with them. I learned a lot and exercised a lot of caution on this one, including vacuuming out the machine after every part and uh, having a bucket of sand on standby just in case there's a fire. I hope you guys learned something on this one. If you have any questions, just drop them in the comments. For Practical Machinist, I'm John Dillahay, bringing you the CAM files. I'm out. Peace.